and there we are. Oh, so I have to admit Katie into the room. Hello, Katie. Oh, and we have uh, Marco coming in. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay, here we are. I might be interrupted every once in a while. I said admit all, but it still keeps popping up. So we'll just deal with that as we can. Welcome. Welcome to Living in Peace in Times of Crisis. And we know that you all here have your own experiences, you have your own perspectives. Um, and of course, we're living through multiple crises right now, collectively, and of course, then that affects us individually. Tonight's topic is exploring survival and thrival. And we have another um, dialogue coming up next Tuesday. And that title is to be determined because uh, Kim and I wish to get from you what kinds of, of um, topics you would like to see in the dialogue. So, um, so David, can I make you co-host so that you can admit people? Um, sure. I think- Thank you, David. <laughs> thank you, David. So, uh, thank you. So, Let's proceed. My name is Tessakaya Gabriel or Tez Gabriel. I know most of you on this call. I'm very glad to see friends and people who will be friends beyond this call. I'm with Kim Weichel and Kim is a colleague that is very familiar with Pathways to Peace and has played a major role in our history and our evolution as an organization. Kim is an author and an activist, and uh, we look forward together to this time. Oh, good, David, you were able to bring him in, right? It's on, <laughs> I figured it out. Good, it's working, that's what we love. Thank you. So um, these two dialogues, both tonight and um, next Tuesday, are really intended to be dialogues. So, um, so the way that this one is going to roll out is that Kim is going to talk a little bit about the origin of, of what brought us to this point today. Um, and then I'm going to tell uh, my story, give some of my own perspectives and give an example of, you know, crisis and my response to crisis and coping and surviving crisis. After my story, Kim will have an opportunity to share her thoughts and perspective on crisis, survival, and thrival. And um, we're doing that not because we think our stories are unique, precious, and powerful, but <laughs> we think that if we give you some of our thoughts, it may prompt your own thinking for our upcoming dialogue tonight. And we've carved out about half of our time for that dialogue. I've already put the discussion questions in the chat box, and I will put them in again as uh, before we enter into that dialogue, the last half of our time together. And then we'll close uh, with asking you uh, what you'd like to be sharing or di in dialogue about when it comes to living in peace in times of crisis. So just some quick quick guidelines for participation. Uh, we are on Zoom, so we ask that you mute yourself um, until it's time for you to ask questions or share in the dialogue, just so we don't get any background noise. Um, in responses at the bottom in your, of your menu, you can raise your hand if you need to interject something. That's helpful because we often can't see everyone on our screens, but if you see as a participant, someone raising their hand, please feel free to alert us so we don't go on talking and we can stop 
and, um, and ask for that person's question or comment. Um, we really, our ground rules are really simple that um, we ask that you fully participate in the dialogue in the last half, that you share your thoughts and ideas based in the discussion questions. Um, and at the same time, we want you to make room at the table for all voices. Um, we have quite a few people uh, here tonight. We're delighted. It is bound to be a dynamic discussion. So just be cognizant of sharing your comments succinctly. And so those are our two ground rules for our time together. As I said, as people were coming in, but not everyone was here, we are recording this dialogue because Kim and I are hoping to capture uh, your, uh, your information, your thoughts, your perspectives, not as quotes linking you to that, but to kind of inform the last revision of the article that Kim is going to be telling you about. At the end of our time together, we don't want uh, the recording to inhibit your, um, your dialogue, your conversation, what it is you choose to share. So at the end of our time together, we'll ask if you're comfortable uh, with sharing through the recording, otherwise more broadly. Otherwise, uh, Kim and I will just keep it close to our hearts as we move forward with finalizing the article. Um, so before we begin and before I introduce Kim, I just want us to take a pause for peace. And so to just sit back in your chairs and to slow your breathing, uh, to breathe a little bit more slowly, a little more deeply. As we open our hearts and minds, and we connect heart to heart. So in that pause, really link to the other hearts in the circle, and then link beyond this circle. Experience that peace within and then push it out to those others that are connecting in heart to heart. Thank you. We, we find that, that opening our hearts as well as our minds always makes dialogue easier, richer, more productive. So thank you. And so now it's my delight to introduce my colleague and friend, Kim Weichel. Kim has so many attributes. Um, she is a published author an activist, and really a change agent. And so Kim, would you like to tell us a little bit about what brought us to this place and time? Sure. Well, firstly, uh, it's delightful to work with Tez. When we met, was it several years ago, I think at the Commission on the Status of Women at the UN, we just deeply connected, partly because of our deep love and connection with Pathways to Peace. When I heard she was the executive director, I beelined it across the room to connect with her. <laughs> uh, and so we have many shared interests, as we all do tonight, together here. You know, and this is such a a time when, as Tez and I were saying, you know, no longer is it a crisis something that may happen in the future in decades to come. I think it's something that we're all in many, many ways going to be needing to, to live with. And how do we develop those resilient skills to keep us ready for whatever might come our way? Nobody could have predicted this pandemic, this economic situation, you know, this election, all of the stuff that's going on. Um, and so I think it's so important that we develop the skills to prepare ourselves. 
Um, you know, there are, whether you go to the, the doctor and within an instant, the doctor looks at you and says, you have cancer and your life changes, you know, or you go to a job that you need to survive and your employer calls you in and says, you're fired. Uh, or, you know, uh, or your house burns down, like mine, ours did in California some years ago. Or your spouse comes home and says, I've fallen in love with somebody else. These things can and do happen. And so I think it's so important, and especially as peace builders. And so what, what uh, brought us together was um, I've been working on a book. I found a, a, an avenue for my voice, and I encourage everyone to write a book with self-publishing. We all can. Um, this one is Lessons from Our Time. Um, I have a chapter that I've written about what are we learning during this pandemic about as our society, um, you know, big issues that we really have to confront as we move forward, whatever the quote new normal is going to be. I have a chapter about women's leadership that I co-authored with another friend, uh, looking at some of the women leaders, prime ministers, presidents, and what they brought to the table that's really important for during this time. And, you know, because I'm a passionate peace builder, I thought, well, you know, it's easy in a sense to live in peace when things are going well, but the hardest is when things aren't, and we all will have those times. So I remember uh, contacting Tez and saying, would you like to do this with me? And she said, yes. <laughs> um, so this is actually my third book, and the model that I've created, and, and I really actually recommend it, is, is having a book with different chapters around a general theme. My first book was about my own personal journey, my work in South Africa during apartheid as a peace builder, my work as a citizen diplomat with Russia, where I've been eight times, a number of other stories. And friends had said, you know, why don't you write these stories down? You've been living during interesting times of history. Why don't you write them down? So I started writing and didn't stop. My second book is Our Voices Matter and about the importance of citizens speaking up, especially now. We need all citizens, our voices, do matter. So this is the latest. And, uh, you know, I will say it's been a journey. Writing an article, or in this case, a chapter, is a journey. You really have to know the person you're working with. And it's, it's um, one that's more than writing. It's, it's embodying it. And out of this journey together, Tez and I said, you know, I think let's have a dialogue because many people are struggling with how do we be peaceful and balanced and centered with so many fears and anxiety out there? And, um, you know, so I, I, it really turned out to be a positive experience. So I think I'll just say that for now, Tez. <laughs> Turn it back to you. Perfect. Thank you, Kim. Um, it has been an amazing and positive journey. So as promised, um, I'm going to kind of share some perspectives on living in peace in times of crisis, survival and thrival. Um, and then Kim will have an opportunity to do so as well, just to prompt your thinking and ideas for our dialogue. So first of all, I want to thank you for listening in advance as um, we each uh, spend a little time in reflection with you. So we are, Dealing, of course, we all know with multiple crises um, externally uh, that become internal crises for us in our lives. And not only a pandemic um, COVID-19, but also the pandemic of racism, also climate change, um, and uh, nuclear, the threat of nuclear war, and the list goes on and on. And so all of this crisis, crisis around us, it feels to me it's almost like the eye of the hurricane. And so again, what prompted our look at this was really how do we maintain as peace builders, how do we maintain that inner balance, that inner strength, what we call that inner peace. And so Again, what we talked about when in our journey together, Kim and I was really as peace builders, we may have some additional challenges as it relates to dealing with crisis. Um, others may have expectations of how we should look or act, um, or perhaps we have those expectations of ourselves that we can't be in crisis because we 
have to have peace within. And we are also committed at the same time as peace builders to honesty and authenticity, um, even when we as well are experiencing crisis. So it, it, it can be a challenge. We also may be called into service um, and support of others. I know that's true for me, and I believe it's true for most, if not all of you. And while I believe that service to others is really a survival technique in and of itself, I, I also know that I cannot be of service to others if I'm in crisis myself. And so, um, and for me, being in service to others calls upon me to put myself first, to nurture myself first, to care for myself first, to, um, to be able to um, take care to, totally of myself first, to be able to be in service to others. And I can speak uh, from a perspective of being a woman that's sometimes very hard for us. Uh, we've often been taught that we need to sacrifice for the betterment of others. Um, but truly for me, survival and thrival means I must put myself first. For me, survival and thrival in crisis is deeply embedded in my spirituality. So uh, that is most of what I'll be sharing in our time together this evening. Um, I, I know that survival and thrival for me is embedded in nurturing what I call my inner navigation system. Um, and that system gives me strength, it gives me comfort, it gives me hope so I can better cope with crisis. And I also want to say that I recognize we all have our own way of expressing what I call spirit or the universe or the divine, and that I recognize that all expressions are good. Uh, there's this beautiful Sufi quote that says, there is only one sound and everything else is echo. Self-care is paramount in survival and thrival, and both Kim and I will, will touch on that a bit tonight. Um, and so we all have our own unique practices um, around self-care, those practices that allow us to really put ourselves first and to love and care for ourselves. Um, for me, self-care, again, is rooted in in three things that are very spiritually based. One is how I perceive the situation, the crisis. Secondly, my attitude. And thirdly, the actions that flow from the other two. So how I perceive the situation is really the story I tell myself about what's occurring. Um, then my attitude for me is that I really embrace an attitude that everything is in my highest good. And then the actions that flow from it keep me centered and balanced as I work to, uh, and work is too big a word, but as I strive to maintain that inner peace. Those issues whirling around us these days are so complex and can be so challenging and so overwhelming that I've um, begun a practice uh, in the last year that is very simple but helps me, um, helps me really not become overwhelmed by the crisis around me. And that practice is a simple commitment to show up as love. I do that every morning, and I do that in every interaction. And while I, it might sound challenging to do that, I don't know, I would say it's liberating. Because if all I need to do is show up as love, I, I can let go of being responsible for fixing things, for uh, coming up with all of the solutions uh, to do do something that makes things better. Um, and so it works for me. It brings me peace. 
I also believe that it does positively change those interactions, those relationships, and those situations. So I simply have determined to show up as love. Um, I've looked in my own life for wisdom and inspiration from historic leaders who have experienced tremendous and horrific situations and have uh, been able to embrace and be uh, love and peace and compassion. One of those, um, and I've asked myself, how did they ever do that? And, and I've come to the conclusion that the reason that they did embrace and be love, compassion, and peace is that it, their very survival and thrival depended on it. And so one of those examples that I would share is Viktor Frankl. He's one of my heroes. Um, some of you probably know about Viktor Frankl. He's an Austrian, he was an Austrian neurologist, psychiatrist, and he was a Holocaust survivor. And Victor said, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. The greatest lesson for me is that regardless of what is whirling around us, we can choose peace, we can choose happiness, and we can even choose to dig deep to find the gift in disguise that's embedded in that crisis. I know also in my work that a crisis can bring on some natural feelings of grief, loss, and powerlessness. So while I know that through my work, I experience that in my own, um, in my own work to cope with crisis. And I don't know about all of you, but for me, powerlessness is the most challenging emotion to manage. I don't do powerlessness well. And so um, the, the wonderful thing about choice is that choice gives us power. So we know that peace begins within and emanates out. We know that Pathways to Peace embraces that. And we know we choose peace. So we choose peace over powerlessness. That is an action we can take to survive and thrive crisis. So a recent uh, example of a personal crisis um, occurred in my life uh, this past August 28th. And it came as a hurricane. So it's been really interesting for me that my metaphor around crisis swirling around me often in my mind's eye looks like a hurricane and I'm standing in the eye of that storm embracing peace. My son Randy lives in Lake Charles, Louisiana, lives and works there. He is um, a leader, uh, a part of a leadership team in a large resort casino there. You might have heard on the news that a major storm came into Lake Charles, Louisiana. We were had some uh, warning, unlike a lot of what's occurring <laughs> in crisis today, we were blessed with some warning that this particular crisis was coming. Um, and so Randy put Natalie, my daughter-in-law, in the car with the, with the doggies and sent her back to Minnesota. But he had to stay because he needed to hunker down in the casino to uh, protect the property as best he could and to keep the generators going. And so, um, so of course, I am the matriarch of a large tribe and a large extended family. And so everyone was engaged in this crisis with Randy and worried about him, concerned about him, having a lot of fear about the storm coming in. And so before the storm even hit, there was just a flurry of texts, you know, 
that were just really about fear and and worry and concern and and it was interesting because i felt like that that energy was just so seductive it's like it wanted to pull me in and yet i was very aware that um, if I succumbed to worry or concern or whatever, that it would not serve Randy, it wouldn't serve the circumstance, it wouldn't serve um, my family members, nor would it serve me. So, um, so instead, my practice was to go into meditation before the storm hit. And I visualized seeing, placing uh, my son Randy, uh, into the arms of the divine. And then I was just, I expressed gratitude and I let it go. So throughout the night as the storm was raging, um, the texts were coming in. I left my phone on, but I slept. So every time a text beamed in, I'd pick up the phone and I'd just be grateful. Grateful for Randy's safety, grateful that he was protected, grateful that whatever happened, it would be in his highest good. So Randy survived the hurricane. And the, while the casino had some pretty major damage, their home in Lake Charles was only a, had a, a little bit of damage. And so there's a happy ending to this particular story. And I know that for so many of the stories that these days, that there isn't a happy ending. So I want to conclude by saying my part of the story, by saying that we are fully expressive human beings. And I honor and have compassion for those who are suffering and experiencing fear, loneliness, despair, and other powerful emotions um, that are totally interrupting their lives and their well-being. At the same time, I can still experience joy. I can still experience inner peace. I can still experience um, happiness because they can coexist with my honor and compassion for others. And I believe that caring for myself and embracing inner peace, joy, happiness, and nurturing my own spirit is the best thing I can do to be in service to others and to survive and thrive myself. So I'm going to conclude with another quote from Viktor Frankl, conclude my story and turn it over to Kim for her perspective. Viktor also said, forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing, your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. Thank you. And now Kim is going to share a perspective on crisis survival and thrival. Back to you. Thank you, Taz. That was just beautiful. Just I really appreciated all that you shared. And like Taz, I also have spiritual practices that, that I do every day that help ground me and help me in my daily life. And then a crisis did hit. I did have a very profound personal crisis mid-March. It's not related to COVID. It happened exactly the same time as COVID of this year. And you know, crisis by its nature is not something we're prepared for, which is why I'll talk in a minute about resilience. Because again, when it happens so quickly out of the blue, you know, to have skills that we can fall back on is helpful because in my case, it just um, ignited some strong emotions that I haven't touched with for years. Fear, hurt, anger, all kinds of things. It was a very difficult situation that went on for many months. Fortunately, it has resolved itself. So what I did was some self-care practices which really were helpful for me. Um, we have that in our article. Um, I firstly was having challenging sleeping uh, because it, I would wake up in the middle of the night, be haunted by some of these fears and so forth. 
And in my case, I sort of was powerless. It wasn't a decision that I needed to make or could make. Um, and so I you know, would try and do my best to get some sleep. And I would give myself permission to take naps late in the afternoon, to maybe take a hot bath, anything that I felt would be nurturing and soulful. Sometimes I have a glass of wine with dinner to help relax me. Um, certainly eating well was really important during this time, really nourishing foods. Uh, exercise is always important for me. I take a morning meditation walk and I asked for prayers and guidance and support, but it also gave me time to sort of process what was going on. What, what did I need to say? What did I need to do? How was I feeling? And those times I, I would take several walks a day. That was really, really important. And I can't um, emphasize enough how, how helpful that was. Um, I also did my spiritual practices of trying to set an intention every day, looking for the gratitude despite the challenges I was going through. I really tried to focus on some gratitude. Um, and my, my resiliency skills, you know, I still was teaching classes and writing this book and doing a number of things which kept my, my through line going, which was really, really helpful to be able to get through these very challenging dark months that I experienced. Um, so I felt like I went to the bottom of a well and climbed back up. Um, but I've learned a lot through it. And so one of the skills that we talk about in the article about resilience, which I think are important no matter what any of us are going through, is firstly having a social network. So I reached out to, in my case, four women, um, four good friends, and I will say one of them was Tez, so I so appreciated Tez. You know, and each one brought different wisdom um, about my situation where I felt comfortable, in sharing, being supported. And so having, um, you know, having a support system is really, really helpful. Um, secondly, having a sense of purpose. Um, because I was writing a book, I, I found that so nourishing for me to be able to try and get my mind off this situation and focus on the book, focus on the courses. Um, so having a purpose is helpful. And it, it's otherwise one can be all consumed by the crisis. Um, Third was be building optimism, you know, and I don't mean Pollyanna by optimism. I mean, it's really important, I think, to face whatever the issue is and be honest and authentic. Um, at the same time, you know, having hope and looking at whatever positives one can bring to the situation. Uh, so, you know, having optimism is helpful. Embracing change. <laughs> Change is, is what we're seeing now, and we don't know what's going to happen next. We're all living with a lot of ambiguity. So it, change is going to happen. I think another one here is acceptance. Um, you know, I know a lot of people at the beginning were saying, oh, this virus is so frustrating, and, you know, I shouldn't have to be stuck home. Well, we have to accept there are certain things happening and that fighting staying home isn't helpful. It's not really achieving anything. So sometimes accepting what is and then trying to do our best within that to make some helpful changes, healthy changes. Um, and then uh, practicing self-care. So Tez mentioned that, I've talked about it. Um, again, women of a certain age, of which I'm one, we were all trained to take care of others first and that taking care of ourselves was considered selfish. And yet, as Tez has so beautifully said, we do have to take care of ourselves and we do have to know what we need and, you know, in a crisis again, it can it, it knocked me off my feet, and so I didn't have my normal skills to fall back on. But you know, um, we have to be able to 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 take care and to make sure that we find that balance and that center, so that we can move forward and deal constructively with the crisis. And then the other is develop some problem solving skills because. You know, we have challenges with small or large, you know, how do we cope with during this, this pandemic, uh, this whole fire situation in the, in the West Coast and all of the hurricanes and everything that we all need to figure out also problem solving skills and how we deal with these things as they come up. So those were a few of the skills that I talked about, you know, that we've talked about in the chapter um, that I have found very, very helpful. And um, you know, I think these days we're going to be confronted with more. And so how do we make sure that we have the resilience to handle the ups and downs of everyday life?
So Taz, I'm gonna bounce it back to you. Thank you so much, Kim, that was perfect. And now we're opening up the floor to dialogue. It occurs to me that some of you might have questions of us. We moved pretty quickly through our, our little uh, prompts for, for the dialogue, so you might need some clarification or want to know more from us. I'm once again putting the discussion questions in the chat, so if there um, are no questions of us, we'll move right into our questions for you to prompt the, the dialogue. And I will say that while we gave you some discussion questions, of course, we're interested in anything that you have to say. So don't let the questions limit your participation. They're meant to prompt some open dialogue. So any questions of either Kim or myself? Or comments or, you know, additions. Yes, thank you. And um, I'm going to take Kim, I'm going to take you off of Spotlight. Thank and you. As I said earlier, uh, we can't always see all of your hands. Um, George, so, George has his hand up. George, thank you. George, it's so good to see you, my friend. Hi, Tez. And hi. Hi, hi, Kim. Um, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Um, I just want to address that I, I have three of my new students uh, on this call uh, with us, three uh, new coming, aspiring uh, global leaders, uh, world leaders, hopefully one day. But I, I'm so impressed by this conversation today because today's conversation in our class centered on this exact conversation, the idea of, of uh, addressing challenges and dynamics in our life. And uh, everything you talked about, I think we were discussing it today, and I'm so happy uh, that my students can not only see today's lesson, but see it applied uh, in your examples and your amazing examples. And I think it's so important uh, to sort of reinforce two dynamics that came out today. Tez, uh, your, your, your powerful beliefs in the divine and, and just giving it, giving it up and, and, and transcending that, that love forward. And Kim, same with you, the idea of, of focusing on intentions and, and putting things in perspective. Uh, because we're going to have challenging dynamics, as you said. I, I often say, I haven't taught this to my students yet, but all roads are paved with the best of intentions. It doesn't always come out that way because of all the challenging dynamics that are waiting for us uh, as, as our day uh, approaches or, or we sort of try to work through it. Um, but I, I just, I'm going to just give the floor back to you and I just want to say thank you for just um, giving us that opportunity to see uh, such a, dy a dynamic approach to a lot of the challenging concerns and issues that we face on a daily basis. So I'll come back a little bit later, some of my own thoughts, but I'll give it back to you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, George. And given you were talking about that today, I see my friend Emma is in in the zoom call i love so, i have photos of emma from the youth event and i think garrett might be a student of yours as well and marco am i right about that yes garrett and uh miss folk is here with me as oh, well catherine catherine good yes, thank catherine. you so, so uh, i'm wondering from the three of you given this is kind of a replay of your earlier discussion if you'd share any highlights from your own perspective um, that had meaning to you. I'll let the two freshmen go before I go. Because <laughs> I'm not in I'm not in his class, but I had this discussion before. You yes. need a tea chest, you go first. All right. So from this discussion from both Miss Tez and Miss Kim, it shows us that even though we embrace our differences, embrace hope through everything, we need to be able to fight through everything for love, for love, for peace, for hope. Um, during this, during these times, I've been fighting for my sister because with her conditions, it's very hard for her to go outside and be with people. So it's hard for us to go see our family and we're doing everything we can to keep her safe, to keep us safe. And that's why for our freshmen here, it's important that they see what 
this, not just this virus, but what everything has happened over their course of their lives. It means something to everything. Thank you, Emma. What do you think, Catherine or Garrett? And there are no right or wrongs, you know, just whatever's on your heart to share. I definitely agree. Like, I was thinking all the same thing Emma was saying. I, like, definitely got how there's always a way to find peace and hope and happiness through whatever you might be going through. There's always, like, a way to find something good. Perfect. Thank you. Mm. Hear it? I found the quote by Viktor Frankl very interesting. Because a lot of times people get so caught up in negative thoughts and emotions and bad situations that they'll start trying to change themselves or yeah. challenge to change themselves. Yeah. And again, did you get that connection around how it is we interpret the story for yes. ourselves? That it isn't about violence and death and abuse. It is about love and compassion. We can choose that. Yeah, it's not easy, but the great leaders of our times have mastered that. And we all can as well. <laughs> cool, thank you. So I'm gonna review the first question with you and then we'll just open it up for you to respond to the question or give us your own questions, thoughts, comments. The questions so, aren't in the chat. They are in the chat. No. No? No. Huh. I can copy them and I'll just copy them and put them in the chat. Thank you. I yes. have done that twice, so it's really odd that they aren't in there. Hmm. So why don't we now. read why don't we read the first one, which is yes. how would you describe the most challenging aspects of coping with a crisis? the most challenging aspects of coping with a crisis. And you know, you can share from your personal experience and more generally, whatever you feel comfortable with. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Who would, who would like to share how and they And wish coped? to hear your voice, even if it's a comment or a thought. Yes, George. I <laughs> uh, think, am I on? Yes, I, I'm, uh, great. we can hear you. Um, so, so Kim, I, I love that question because there's so many parts to it in the sense that you say, how do we cope in, when we're in the middle of a crisis oftentimes? And, and many times it, it's, it's twofold. Are we the cause of the crisis or are we trying to find solutions in the crisis uh, based upon the actions of others? And um, that's a big issue because oftentimes there are people in our lives that, I don't want to say uh, crisis junkies, but but they sort of tend towards that always that 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 issue where I don't know I don't know how to find solutions. So this becomes a recurring situation, and we sort of get caught up in other people's crisis because we're always trying to save them from from themselves. Um, and then we become sort of immersed in that in that world, I guess, if you want to call it that. And uh, so the question is 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 my reaction causing me as my negative reactions, I, I think you want to say that, are my negative reactions sort of causing me to be unable to sort of rationally see my way, see, see my way through it. Uh, because my emotions are sort of blocking me from rationally finding the solutions. Because I'm so overwhelmed by everything that's around me. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just a way of just trying to approach what you were saying. Yes, and I'll just add, I think that's, that's beautiful, George. <laughs> You know, for me, it was also managing these intense emotions that I hadn't had to deal with for so long. And again, as a peace builder, if we truly are able to live out of love and peace and suddenly bingo, we're cast into a situation where this intense anger, intense fear, you know, it's, it's managing those, but um, being able to still find some hope through it and being able to do the daily steps. It's both survival. Sometimes we have to almost go back to just taking the daily steps to get through the crisis. Then, then we can move into thrival. Um, and, and giving ourselves permission to do what we have to do to take care of ourselves. I like that. Yeah, and I would add to George that, you know, I think that, you know, the, it's always about us. <laughs> I want to say that, that, you know, it's always about um, 
whatever is happening out here, that where we need to focus is here. Mm -hmm. And as Kim said, managing those emotions and still remaining authentic, right? Because if we're, if we're struggling ourselves with maintaining um, our inner peace, our inner happiness, our inner joy because of what's happening out here, that's natural. And we just need to kind of, as Kim said earlier, accept that. Except, you know, this is a crisis, being aware that this is affecting me, and then having our practicing uh, ways in which we can come back to our own center. Because, um, because that's what needs to happen first. Occasionally, we get the opportunity, because you're really good at this, George, I know, to resolve that conflict with the other person. <laughs> but, for, but it begins here first. Yes. And then if we can't resolve that conflict with the other person, we are still fine. Yeah. We're still good. All is well here. Yeah, David. Um, one of the things that stood out for me was <clears throat> what both of you talked about. And Kim identified a variety of things that you did to take action. That you did to take care of yourself. You know, doing some kind of exercise, you know, physical activity, um, some kind of meditative process and what works for you um, with friends. Or, you know, so it's really being aware of, but it, you know, developing the self-awareness, which takes time. And I think that's part of life experience. My, my basic view is we're here in this physical world and it's all about learning. It's all about learning who we are. It's, you know, powerful lessons uh, through this life journey, but learning some of those things about what works for us takes some time. It takes some learning or, you know, experience of, of applying that. Um, and that the, the powerful thing that you also mentioned, <clears throat> Tezukai, is about choice. And, you know, Victor Frankl is just like, and, and sometimes it feels like I don't have a choice. You know, it's just like overwhelming and uh, you know, I have to deal with that. So it's sometimes it takes, you know, going around a bit to say, wait a minute, I have, I do have a choice and it can be difficult, you know, to you kind of get balanced again and uh, you know, do have a choice. And um, one of the things that I, you know, looked at, I actually had an experience today about, and this is on a, on a minor level, but still a choice, um, this evening, I, and I was you know, talking to people about we had the uh, Rotary, we had the Rotary International discussion around um, the peace, you know, peace within Rotary. And, so on. and uh, someone was saying, "Well, wait a minute, the the, the presidential debate is the same time. You know, how can how can you do that?" And I said, "Well, with Rotary, I have input in. I can have some effect on the other." I can see on the, the, the reruns, the news, I don't have any effect on that. So it's like making a choice as to what serves and what doesn't, particularly when you're talking in the context of peace building and being peace builders. I just <clears throat> want to say that it has been my experience that 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 awareness, that self-awareness, and that wisdom is coming in in uh, huge waves with uh, our younger peace builders, and so I I've been both um, amazed and delighted to see that. And so I'm wondering, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, and you never are, Renor, but I wonder if you would speak because I so. Um, as you know, cherish your voice um, and your wisdom. Well, thank you first, Hezekiah and Kim, for being the focal points and, and unifying us all together here. Um, I think what I'd like to say at this moment is that it's important for us to not uh, wait till the crisis hits. Um, and I say that because many of them or most of them, you can't uh, always see them coming. But what a crisis does is it activates, um, it pushes you to make the changes that you know you have to make. 
not only within yourself, but also in your surroundings. And that those those indications come always through your intuition and through through the intuitive voice of your soul. So we a lot of times we we wait on subconsciously or even consciously we wait till a crisis hits in order to make a change. Um, so I think that it's important for us to to, to not gather or, or, or build your courage when you're in the midst of it. Because when you're in the midst of it, everything seems very cloudy uh, in terms of vision. So, um, you know, when you see, when you see, there's, this, there's a quote by Ian Van Zandt, when you see crazy coming across the street. Very simple, but it's so true. So, and crazy looks or chaos or crisis, however way you want to label it, it comes in very subtle ways and it comes in very obvious ways. So that is what I feel called to share with you. And I thank you again. Thank you, Renoir. Yes, I, I'm, I openly tell people that I, I am committed to protecting my peace. And that means that I don't engage in some things <laughs> because I have that commitment. I love when crazy comes across the street. That's perfect. It's a perfect quote. So who else either has a question or would like to respond to our, as peace builders, how would you just, and by the way, everyone on this call is a peace builder. Uh, as peace builders, how would you describe the most challenging aspects of coping with crisis? Katie has her hand. Good, Katie. Uh, so I really like that you both have addressed um, kind of more of being a woman and dealing with crisis. Um, Tezakai and I have talked about this a bit. I've been dealing with um, a chronic illness for the last seven or eight years that has kind of turned my life completely upside down from where it was. And that is something that I feel that we do not teach young girls enough is that we need to look out for ourselves, that we don't always need to be the strong one for everyone, you know, that it's really important to focus on our mental health as well. You know, I grew up in a family where talking about anxiety and depression and things wasn't a very kosher topic. And, you know, it's something that, you know, I've had to force upon my family to have conversations about. And it's something that we just don't, we make each other feel weak about by saying, you know, by telling people we need extra help, that we need more emotional support, and that we need to back each other, you know, and I feel like as women, especially, we're always told a little bit more that we just need to keep it together. And I feel like that's something that's so important that we need to instill on the younger generations coming up. I so agree with you, Katie. We actually have a little bit in our article about that, that, you know, our, our, his, our cultural programming can get in the way in so many ways. But as women, you know, we need to set boundaries and we need to ask for the help we need. And I just love that you added that. So important. And I want to second that as well as the previous comment about doing what we can to take care of ourselves so it doesn't lead to a crisis. Sometimes crises can be prevented for sure. Sometimes they, they're not. Uh, but sometimes that's really what gets people's attention <laughs> is they might put things off with their health, with their finances, whatever. So the, to the extent that we can really be taking regular good care of ourselves, that's the best way to avoid most crises, not all. But I think, you know, being aware of that. Good point. As, as many people um, <clears throat> might have already heard, uh, the, the translation of crisis is opportunity. And we, I appreciated what uh, Catherine had said about there's always a way to find the good in something. That is uh, a very mature uh, viewpoint from my experience. Um, a lot of times as a young person, we don't know what questions to ask. We're not even sure who yet 
we have we are or who we are becoming if that's someone that we like um, and it takes it takes these these things take time preparing for a crisis is the self-care that I think both you both are, are talking about. Uh, part of self-care is that you're building your foundation. Even if you don't know consciously what that is, I do believe that we are preparing our, our foundation just through everyday living as the best we can do in each moment, to create value in each moment. And yes, there is value in everything, especially the hard stuff, because that is where we learn most of our life's lessons. What does come is that, um, in my experience, that even as much as we might prepare for something, the realities are always very different than what we think they should look like. So to be open and aware and available requires some of that preparation of self-care, which I think includes uh, a few things, such as um, being aware of our thoughts. And any negativity that we have toward ourselves, which is generally speaking, we are the most negative to ourselves. We used to say we know our own warts, and so therefore we know our problems, we know where our suffering and our but is, and our buttons can be pushed. But to to stop and re redirect any energy of self slander, putting ourselves down because we grew up in a family where they teased you, perhaps, or it became part of the society. Even in Hollywood, the 15 minutes of fame, after that, it's slandering that person, putting them down. This is the way our society is. We are not a nurturing society. So we get to learn from other cultures. But ultimately, it comes to not self-slandering. To, to When we start putting ourselves down, we have to become aware of that and find, again, why we do that. What's the value in that? And if it doesn't create any value for us anymore... Perhaps it did at one time. I always have appreciation. I call it an attitude of gratitude for everything, especially yeah. the hard stuff. I'll release it back to the universe with my appreciation when it no longer serves me. Yeah. And another point that I wanted to make um, is that in, <clears throat> in self-care, uh, there's a, a phrase that's called, put yourself in the equation. In other words, it's not so much of looking at other people and what their needs are, or how we can fulfill either another person's needs or how we project our own role in society or in the environment and in the family or in the workplace or school, whatever it might be. These are our projections. So to put ourselves in the equation means to bring ourselves and our needs to the front, to the forefront, to truly allow ourselves to not in an egocentric way or in a narcissist way, as we've seen how that works and it doesn't, but in a, in a most compassionate way. How can I be my best self to bring my highest self to this situation so that I am nourishing and nurturing myself and others? And I kind of disagree on one point that you made, Tez, not that I have to agree with everything, but when you said that when you're not feeling strong in yourself, you're not able to give to other people. I... Um, had a, an, a, an incident. It was a, a horrible thing, like what I guess Kim is describing, but mine lasted over 10 years. I was kidnapped, and it was a very brutal and violent experience, and it took a very long time for me to not just live, but to regain some health, be able to walk again, to be able to contribute to society. And I know that from my experience in healing, and that's a lifelong healing, um, I know that there are many times when I could only just stay in bed or sit in the chair and, and be in my own pain and my own need, um, and I couldn't really function. However, if a friend, one of those wonderful support group people that we all can attract, if a friend happened to have called me and said, look, I, I know you're really struggling with your own stuff, but I really have a problem. Can I talk to you? Or can you come over? Or can I come over? not COVID time, but I always noticed that what I couldn't do for myself, I could muster up the courage to do for someone else. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is not because I didn't have the energy. The energy was in me, but I just didn't find the, the I had was so busy processing and trying to make, you know, manage each moment that I could not separate the needs. But for another person, I could do that. And I think that this is the, the compassionate nature of our Buddhahood or of our spiritual self. The and final point that I want to make is, is the, again, back to the self-care, where I do really, uh, uh, really fully feel and that our, our spiritual practice, our personal 
progress and an approach to the more esoteric, inconspicuous activities of our thoughts and our words and our deeds and our lives requires that practice. It requires a day-to-day, moment-to-moment appreciation and activity. It requires um, having some faith in something and aiming for something and having goals that we actually might, they might be short-term, small little goals. You know, I had a goal once to be able to walk to the bathroom myself. Now that doesn't sound like a big deal to anybody, but for me at that time, it was a very essential goal. And when I made it, I felt proud. I had worked hard to get there. And it's not that need that needs to be discussed with other people because you want to suspend judgment you want to be able i want to i want to be able to look at my life and the events that happen from a clear clear perspective without the the noise or the uh, emotional attachments to it to be able to do my growth my growth is how deep down the rabbit hole do i truly want to go how far into infinity and beyond do i want to experience the power of living and we underestimate our power way too often. We give it away without realizing we have it. But we are extraordinarily powerful as people and human beings. And I think that uh, we only sell ourselves short when we do that, you know, that little negative talk. Thank you. Thank you. So that was um, beautiful, Eric, Sue. I just want to add one point, uh, something that you raised, which is really uh, a great point, Sue. And that is when you're working with other people. Sometimes in a crisis, you know, when friends learn that uh, you're going through whatever it is, generally people wanna help, they wanna do something, but you need to be aware what's needed. So sometimes we just need to be alone. We need silence. (laughs) Sometimes we really wanna be with other people. We really wanna take a walk with somebody or we really wanna go out for a meal. We need to get out of the house perhaps. But so we need to be very aware. What is it that person needs? And I think generally people are, oh, can I bring a meal? Oh, can I take you? Oh, can I? And sometimes the person actually just needs to be left alone. So it's it's, it's being uh, thoughtful and asking, you know, what is it that would be, best serve you? I think so. That's another thought. And maybe, Tez, at this point, we might want to go to the second question. That's what I was thinking. Oh, but there we go. <laughs> We're doing the Vulcan mind meld again. Yes, yes. So, um, I did want to say, Sue, that I totally agree with you. That, And I think I mentioned that for me, service to others is a survival and thrival technique, as long as it is nurturing and not depleting, which is dependent on me taking care of myself. But I so agree with what you said, and it was beautiful. Mm-hmm. Now, I wonder, though, some we haven't heard from some folks, and before we move to the next question, even though we want to move to the next question, does anyone who hasn't yet spoken, uh, would you like to say something in response to this question or what has been said? Okay, well, the next question up is, uh, in the midst of crisis, what inspires hope for you? Yes, Catherine, and then George. Catherine first. You can unmute. There you go. Uh, I think for me, it's like looking forward. Like, obviously, we're in the middle of a huge, multiple crises right now. It's looking forward to, like, the future and what we're going to do once we get out of it. And what, and even just looking forward to tomorrow, I'm going to see my friends or just, like, keep looking forward and looking for the good and the hope and the possibility. Perfect. Thank you. Who else? George, I think you're next. Uh, honestly, I, I got so excited that Catherine um, <laughs> wanted to join in. <laughs> I forgot what you were going to say. Right? Yeah, I actually did. Um, but but what, what I'll just say is, is that um, something that uh, I, I hate name dropping, but I remember I had the opportunity when I was working with Seeds of Peace uh, to work with Dr. Henry Kissinger. And we all were all allowed to ask him a question. And um, my question to him was, do, do you ever get tired trying to save the world? You know, because Great that's, question. you know, it, it was, because he's constantly flying, you know, between uh-huh. the Palestinians and the Israelis. And he said, he said, no. He said, I'll tell you why. And he said it was such, you know, his German accent, very thick. Yes. But he said, George, he says, let me tell you, Every crisis teaches me something. You know, every day I can learn from what I went through. Um, so I, I sort of 
welcome it. I welcome the opportunity to learn from it and how I, I can apply it in my own life. So, uh, so that I never forgot that that uh, that he said, let me learn from this. And I think today in, in class, I don't know if I said it today, probably it might be tomorrow's lesson, but it, it's a great quote from Frederick Douglass, which is, "Without struggle, uh, there can be no progress." It's, it's something like that. But it's we we learn from our struggles, we progress from our struggles, um, and we grow from our struggles. So um, there is crisis. We. I love what was spoken about today, about returning back to the soul, to the heart. Uh, I love what Manoa spoke about, the idea of not waiting for the crisis uh, to prepare ourselves. Um, so, so I think that was great. And these lessons and these, these workshops are such great uh, learning environments. Uh, and I'm so glad. I think what David said is before he left us now, but uh, he said, you know, I, I, I could be watching the debate. I could be watching the game, but, but I can't have an impact there. I can have an impact here. Um, and he did. And I, I'll remember that quote. And I'll use it again tomorrow. Yes. Um, and we can have impacts in our crisis. And we can learn and, and, and love through the crisis and, hope, and recover through the crisis. And I think these are important things. And have hope for our crisis. And I think these are important things we can uh, remember. Um, to, hope gives us something to live for. And um, I think that's, that's something we should never lose sight of. Uh, and that's that's important. And good job, Catherine, for jumping in. I love that. Good stuff. <laughs> I, know, I was excited too. Okay. Emma's clapping too, so yes. you get lots of support for lending your voice. So who else? Emma, go. So yeah. what inspires hope for me is knowing that whatever problem that I'm in, I know it'll reach an end. I know I will get to the last part of my problem. I know I will reach the end and I wouldn't say be victorious because I know we have a lot of problems up ahead for us, but we've reached the solution. We should reach the final problem and we can figure it out and then we can go. What I, day to day, what I think is I wake up, I go to school, I eat dinner, homework, go to bed. And that's every day. Sometimes it changes, but it's mostly the cycle. Mm -hmm. And those little little snippets of hope, little things of possibilities like this conference or the debate can take me away from my homework and inspire hope in me to watch it and be intrigued and learn. Because learning is what we need to do. We are learning every day. What Lenore said, when you see crazy, it's numbing cross when you see crazy, crazy coming across the street, I don't cross the street. I just walk right into the craziness because <laughs> that's what my life is. It's crazy. And I love it. And I love every second of it. So inspiring hope for me, I think, is the crazy. The craziness awesome. in life, the craziness on the road is what inspires hope for me because I know I'll reach the end. I love it, Emma. We bow to you. And what I loved about what you said or what came to mind for me was that for you, hope is really in challenging those, those issues that come up. And even if you can't be victorious in stopping climate change, you can be victorious in dealing with your own emotions and, re and remaining you know, in peace, in love, whatever that inner strength is. So yay for for what you said. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Did I interpret it correctly? Emma, did I interpret it correctly? Facing oh. kind of the challenge or the fear and... Yes. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking to someone else. I've no, been on Zoom no, calls okay. all day. <laughs> that's okay. I but yes? To, if it's okay, I'd like to add something. I sure. do have to leave in a, in a moment. Um, but oh, we'll I, miss you. <laughs> I will miss you guys. I look forward to next week. But I wanted to add another perspective um, for the for just for the thought of it. Um, mm -hmm. What George was reiterating about David's comment on um, I can have an impact here. I can't have an impact there. I again agree. Uh, I, I don't agree with that uh, in the sense that I believe that we are so powerful as as 
as people, as life forms, that we, we see that we don't, can't even begin to see how powerful we are. I think that we have an impact no matter where we are and what we do. And some people have such a strong life force that they can just walk into a room and say nothing, but, they're, the, but the people can feel their energy and the vibration of their intention. I think the intentions carry across time and space, across Zoom, whether you're there or not. I actually do think that that my power of thinking and feeling is so strong that I can have an impact in tonight's debate. For example, I, I think that, again, because we diminish ourselves, uh, as a, if society does that as a, as a rule, um, in, but I think that there's much more going on to each one of us. Look at how we think when we're, when we're processing, when we're quiet and when we're alone. Of the things that come up for us, we are magical. You, you have dialogues with, uh, you know, in incredible situations and, and relationships that are, like I say, very intangible. So uh, just, to, just something to think about. Thank mm -hmm. you. And, you know, we all have different perspectives. That's what makes life beautiful, right? Yes. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so no, we should, like none is right or wrong, but I, but I, but I just yeah. wanted to make that note. Yeah. And so we should encourage everyone to voice own differences because that's what helps us all grow and learn together so Absolutely. i i'm just gonna see um bye you uh, bye sue thank you for coming thank you for coming sue um let's see i think we should put this third question on the table let's and then that. let's see if we can check in with folks who haven't yet spoken just to see what's on their mind or heart so should we read the third question? Sure. And so what advice would we give to other peace builders or other friends who are struggling in the midst of a crisis situation? What advice would we give them? Who would like to tackle that? Garrett. Oh, Garrett. Uh, yes, I would like to tell them to not let the trouble and the negative emotions cloud your judgment. Wow, very beautiful. Thank you. Yes, Catherine. Um, I usually, like, to my friends, I usually say something like, it's all going to be okay. It's okay to be stressed. It's okay to be nervous. It's okay to have all your emotions. But you have to remember that it's all going to end. This is only temporary, and you're going to be fine. Perfect. <laughs> Sometimes what I say, I, uh, what my grandfather said was, stop and smell the roses. You stop. Uh you breathe, you think, and then you continue on with life. <laughs> George? Um, I often say, don't become a prisoner of your own expectations. I think that was brought up today about doubt. Uh, I think Kim brought that up before, that uh, sometimes the doubts uh, can, getting out, can get in our way. Um, recognize your doubts uh, and, and, and embrace the, as Emma, I think, said, that uh, we can grow from this, we can learn from this, uh, and well, every little snippet will teach us something, uh, something that we can use, and um, that's what that's 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 enough. That's Perfect. Okay. So, um, even Patty or Joni, anything you would add to the conversation at this point? As soon will and they be. all have so much wisdom. <laughs> we they know do. this. That's the thing. <laughs> they have so much wisdom. Would one of you like to unmute and just do a little check-in? Thank you, Patty. Okay, I think the only thing that I might add is what helps me, even though I don't quite understand it all the time, is to know that whatever is going on, that it's absolutely perfect. And I don't have to change it. I, I may have to feel like I have to survive it, but I don't have to change it. I don't have to do anything. Um, and sometimes not doing anything is the best action to take. Perfect. Acceptance, right? Yes. Exactly. Everything is perfect. Acknowledgement and acceptance. Beautiful. Avon or Joni? There's Avon. Just quickly, just thank you you know, both Tez and Kim for your very vulnerable 
sharing of your stories, but most important for formulating some questions about engaging a true dialogue because so much at this time is allowing the place and space and acceptance for everyone to share what is arising for each of them and also share what their experiences are. And I think um, for me, I'm gonna unfortunately have to leave uh, now, but I just, I think what I wanna do is end with a quote from this very old mantra um, uh, called the mantra of unification. The souls of all are one and we are one with them. We seek to love, not hate. We seek to serve and not exact due service. We seek to heal and not hurt. Let pain bring due reward of light and love. Let the soul control the outer form and life and all events and bring to light the love that underlies the happenings of the time. Let vision come and insight. Let the future stand revealed. Let inner union demonstrate and outer cleavages be gone. Let love prevail. Let all people love. Beautiful. That's beautiful, Avon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Joni, you. would you like to check in? Joni, I know you're traveling. There you are. I'm driving. I'm, I'm driving. Oh. <laughs> I'm driving. I just stopped it as the first signal I've come to in hours. Oh. <laughs> wow. Squirrelly. Lovely uh, presentation. I got to go now. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, thank you, Joni. <laughs> Good to check in. So let's just do one more round, Robin, and then we'll wrap. And so, uh, Kim, do you want me to just call on whoever's on my screen, or would you like to? Just sure. to see if we yeah, want if they to have any final word, because I have a little a reading, you know, and so. Yeah, we'll, we'll close after these kind of, uh, let's call them some group reflections. Just, you know, sure. what's on your mind or heart as we kind of close down our time together. So um, I'm just going to call folks based on who I see on my screen. Garrett, any final reflections? I found tonight very interesting. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for being here. Your voice meant a lot. Thank Emma? you. Emma? Um, also with Garrett and Catherine, I'm very proud of both of you for coming in and speaking out. Uh, these are your first steps. I know I was doing this about two years ago with Mr. Anthony, and I've been fortunate to join Tezekaya last year. So also, sometimes our actions speak louder than words. So what we do in this world, what steps we take towards peace can really matter for what comes next in life. Such wisdom, Emma. <laughs> Catherine? Thank you like so much for like having us, and thank you so much, Emma. <laughs> Uh, anytime. I really enjoyed this. I think I learned a lot. I'm <laughs> keeping notes. Um, no, I really learned that you have to, you have to care for yourself and don't underestimate yourself because you can really do anything. Perfect. And George? Um, one of the things that people always say to me, how do you, how do you stay so positive? And I tell them because I surround myself with people who have are positive, you know, you have to, you have to um, surround yourself or else you can lose yourself in, in, in the mist as was said tonight. So, um, and tonight was a beautiful, positive place to be. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you. And Katie? I have to say in agreement with George, um, one of the things, especially during COVID and, you know, having, dealt with my own issues that I've really learned is find your tribe, make sure that they've got your back. You know, at the end of the day, those are the people who you're going to be able to call and say, things just aren't going right. I either need you to have my back and just be there for me or just sit there in silence with me, drink a glass of wine, just be there. You know, I mean, it's, especially during COVID, this has really been, I think, a very eye-opening experience to learn, you know, 
who is really there for you and who's there to keep calm your anxieties and really just watch out for you during all of this. Thank you, Katie. I love that. Uh, Tez, I just wanted to add, I, I think we've asked everybody, right? Um, yes. There's a song that um, has meant a lot to me by jo the late John Denver. And the line, I don't have the words just right, but it's all this joy, all this pain, all this love, all this suffering, such as life. And so, you know, when things happen, you remember, well, that's part of the circle of life, isn't it? Not everything is going to be positive and up. And so, in fact, the, the, we learn more from the harder times in many ways. So I, I just remember that song. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, yes. And, you know, if we're open-hearted people, we express the full range of emotions. Yes. And so it's a good thing because it is a demonstration of being open-hearted and being connected. Um, that we can express a full range of emotions. So, so next October 6th, we hope that you can join us. And what we hoped was that perhaps you could mention kind of some topics that you'd like to bring into that dialogue. If you don't have kind of, if we're putting you on the spot and you can't think of anything, that's okay. If you'd rather not say it out loud, but we'll put it in the chat, that's good too. Um, but let's just pause a moment and see if you can generate kind of the areas of interest around living in peace in times of crisis so that Kim and I can go away and, and put something together to, trump, to kind of prompt that next dialogue. So what are your thoughts? I know it's getting late. <laughs> yes, Katie. I'd say maybe a discussion as to how to turn personal crisis into action. Um, you know, how to take whatever's we're feeling at this moment and how to move it forward into something that's beneficial to others as well. Well, I love that. We'll definitely yeah, that's bring that great. up. Anything else? Well, if you think of someone, something, everyone on this call has access to my email. <laughs> so uh, if it's not direct, then through Mr. Anthony. And so feel free to feed us any of those topics. And uh, we don't know who will show up at the next dialogue. So there may be a li little bit of repeating some key um, highlights, but we'd really love to kind of raise some deeper and broader issues to prompt the discussion. So we're hoping that you will join us in that next dialogue. Kim? I agree, and I have a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt I'd like to share, which, it isn't enough to talk about peace, one must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it, one must work at it. So it is an ongoing daily journey, isn't it? So uh, we appreciate everyone's participation. Uh, I've taken a lot of notes too. We might have some more ideas to add to our chapter. This is wonderful, and Tez, it's always wonderful to work with you doing this together. <laughs> I am just so delighted, Kim. And so I also want to thank you for your participation and for your voice. I have a final short quote to share as well. But before we do that, I want to check in about the recording um, to ask if anyone is uncomfortable about more broadly sharing what you shared in our time together today. If one person is uncomfortable, then we don't share it. Um, so it has to be unanimous support for moving it forward, unless you're uncomfortable. And we hope we've created enough safety for you to tell us. So I want to see heads nod or do this. So should we record, go ahead and um, more broadly distribute this this session. 
Yes, I see some yeses. Is there anyone that would be uncomfortable um, with, with us um, sharing this session? And if you are, just raise your hand and tell us you're uncomfortable. Seeing none, I think we're okay. Thank you. So um, from both Kim and I, we're just delighted with the conversation here today. And I uh, will close with a quote from the Dalai Lama. The more you are motivated by love, the more fearless and free your action will be. So uh, thank you again. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you next week. Yes. All right. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Bye. Man. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. That was great, Tess. Good job. <laughs> I love you, George. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Something to start with. I'll see you next week. See you next week.